Hi, and welcome to another Clean Machine Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And I have a very special guest, a good friend, uh, Glenn Merzer. Uh, Glenn is a playwright, screenwriter, stand-up comedian, author, and co-author of 12 books, an aspiring arm wrestler, and just one hell of a good guy. I'm really excited to introduce to you, and we're going to have some really good conversation about his new book, America Goes Vegan, and I hope he's right. We're going to talk the book and all things vegan, so welcome, Glenn. Hey, Jeff, good to be with you, and I can't wait to arm wrestle you. <laughs> Me too. Uh, us guys over over 60 arm wrestling, that's going to be a sight for it to see. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, so um, before we jump into this, let me just get the disclaimer out of the way. This video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So welcome, Glenn. And 12 books. Wow. Did you uh, have any idea in your youth that you would become such a proficient writer? You know, I, I wanted to be a playwright. And I still think that writing plays is, you know, probably what I do best and what 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 I love most. Um, but I kind of stumbled into writing books, arguing for the plant exclusive diet, and uh, I keep just keep trying to make the case from one angle and then another. Now you, like myself, you are actually even a longer term. Uh, at least vegetarian. Um, tell us when you started and why you started. I started uh, when I was 17. I'd been starting to think about it when I was maybe 15 or 16 because I had two uncles. One was in his 40s, one was in his 50s, who died the same year of a heart attack. Um, and then I, my mother, who was then in her 50s, got heart disease and she got angina pains just going up a few steps. And she wasn't very much overweight or anything. She just had the heart disease that ran in her family and it ran in my father's family. So on my father's side, uh, most of the men died in their 50s of heart attacks. I never met my grandparents. Uh, so I thought, if I eat the way these people eat, I'm going to be middle-aged at 25. So why, why would I want to be middle-aged at 25? So what I can't remember is exactly when and where I learned that it's meat that causes heart, heart disease. But I, th I think it wasn't hard to learn that because I think it was widely known and accepted even then. Mm -hmm. This is a long time ago. But even then, we knew that it's eating meat uh, that causes heart disease. So I decided, you know what, I'll start, I'll become a vegetarian starting the first day of summer vacation uh, after my junior year of high school. So uh, that day, that first day of summer, I decided I'm a vegetarian. I got up in the morning and I had put a, an English muffin in the toaster and I had it with jam. And then the phone rang. It was my old buddy, Dave. And I said, Dave, congratulate me. I became a vegetarian. And he said, that's great. Since when? And I said, well, you know, since breakfast. <laughs> and he laughed at me. And that was 50 years ago. And I haven't had meat since. So it, it may have helped that he laughed at me. <laughs> Some motivation there. Yeah. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to let him get any satisfaction. When uh, when I uh, switched to a, a vegan diet too, I I got all the questions, all the obvious ones. Where do you get your protein? What about things that you're going to get enough nutrition? You know, don't you need milk for bones? All of the typical stuff. And um, being in the science field, I said, "Well, wait a minute. I know this is right. I got to figure out why this is right." <laughs> you know. Uh, I know it feels right, so it doesn't make any sense for me to um, to 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 get this nutrition from animals. And then the more and more I learned through science and biology, the more I was like, "Oh my God! Not only is this right, this is the way we should all be." <laughs> but 
having to explain that to people, that's a whole nother thing. So let's let's jump right into your book here. Um, in, in reading the, the preface to your book, I was really struck by one of the things because it's, as you and I are both long-term vegans, I'm sure we have used many, many different ways of approaching conversations to try to appeal to someone because people are different. Some like uh, facts, some like to hear it from the heart, you know, some like something that they can relate to. So everybody is different, but this quote from you, and I'll quote, uh, vegans do no one any favors by being shy about their diet. We all need to get on board and get our friends on board. But how do you get everyone on board without preaching? That's the vegan's dilemma. That really struck me because I've been, I've been working on that one for 38 years and you for 50 years. So yeah, what have you learned in that time in five decades? Well, actually, I haven't been working on that for 50 years because when I became a vegetarian at 17, and I didn't become a vegan until my 30s, but when I became a vegetarian at 17, I was doing it just for my own longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't interested in what anybody else was eating. I didn't think it was any of my business. You know, if somebody raised the subject and asked me why I was doing it, I would explain because of my family history. Um, and as far as the animals go, that's why I think most people um, were going vegetarian at th that time. It was mostly uh, because of compassion for the animals. And uh, I certainly felt that compassion and I felt um, uh, repulsed by the thought of killing animals and eating them. But at the same time, I, I didn't want to make that case. I didn't want to argue with people that they were being uh, cruel, you know? So I never preached. Um, and I just felt that if some people think that pigs are food, then they could think that. To me, it doesn't look like food. It looks like an animal. Um, so um, I, I didn't run into the problem of how to try to persuade people uh, really until I wrote my first book with Howard Lyman called Mad Cowboy. And I learned from Howard, who was a fourth generation cattle rancher turned vegan and animal rights activist. I learned from him how he had destroyed the land in Montana that had been a, an organic farm in the past. Um, and, uh, and I realized that th this is crucial that everybody do this. Everybody go plant-based for the earth. Uh, you know, the animals too. <laughs> But that, I've always found that a hard case to, to argue for because it always seemed to me that people either feel that or they don't. Um, but, you know, we're in a profound climate crisis today. Uh, we're breaking temperature records all over the, the globe. Greece has been on fire. Um, you know, the waters off the coast of, of Florida are 100 degrees. I mean, we're like the, the frog in the proverbial pot of boiling water. You know, it's, it's the climate crisis is drastic and people are saying, we have to do anything we can do to stop this. Well, there's one thing we can do. Stop eating animals, free up all that grazing land, rewild it with forests, and we could actually reverse climate change. And it's the only thing that'll work. So now we have to preach, for lack of a better word. We have to try to convince others to go plant-based for the sake of the planet, never mind the animals. And I think that's that's important and so interesting that are you coming at it from, you know, the health aspect, uh, which is I care about me, are you coming about it from the animal aspect, which is I care about all life, not suffering? Uh, or are you coming about it from the environmental message, which is, hey, without the environment, no animals or no humans at all. So it, it's kind right. of the, 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 the piece of the cart before the horse, so to speak. Well, I mean, when we had this study that I just put up on the screen, a uh, recent Oxford study, 
that showed vegans had 75% less carbon global uh, greenhouse uh, gases than meat eaters. And it wasn't a lot of meat. It was 100 grams a day, which, I mean, that could be done in a single meal for most meat eaters. Um, and so 75% reduction, that's a huge impact. And um, I would bet that that understates it. Because what they do, Jeff, is they look at direct emissions. So they look how many direct emissions are involved when you eat meat. Well, there's the methane from the cows. There's the methane and the nitrous oxide from the cow manure. There's the inherent inefficiency of growing grain and then feeding 10 pounds of grain to get one pound of meat. There's the fact that the meat has to be frozen. There are all those direct emissions, but they don't usually look at the indirect emissions or what's called carbon opportunity cost because that's harder to calculate and also because they just don't think that way. But by that, I mean, what if we weren't raising cows and we rewilded all that grazing land? That's 40% of the earth, 40% of the earth. And then we use another few percent of the earth to grow grain to feed to the animals. So it's something like 43% of the earth in total is being used in total is being used so that people could eat meat and, and drink milk. So if you factor in what would happen if we reforested even half of that land hmm. and revegetated it, rewilded all the biodiversity that would come back and all the carbon dioxide that would be sequestered, that's the only way to reverse the climate crisis. It's actually kind of insane that all we talk about is the burning of fossil fuels. It's a, it's a small part of the problem. I'm not here to defend the fossil fuel industry, but it's a small part of the problem. And if we stopped burning any fossil fuels tomorrow, if tomorrow we had only electric cars and all the electricity was generated by the sun and we had solar airplanes and we cooked with uh, electric rather than with gas and we heated our homes uh, you know with heat pumps and with without burning any fossil fuels even then the planet will continue heating up cuz there would still be 1.5 billion cows belching methane there would still be all the deforestation that occurs because of animal agriculture. We would still be burning the land and having pasture maintenance fires to, to burn everything the cows don't graze. So the planet keeps heating up. But if you think of the reverse fantasy, what if tomorrow everybody went vegan and there was no more animal agriculture? We could still have our cars and airplanes. We could still live a 21st century life. Um, you know, uh, again, moving to solar and wind is better, but we could still burn some fossil fuels because we will anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can still have uh, the modern luxuries that were afforded by the burning of fossil fuels. We need to make them more efficient and try to get off fossil fuels but we would be sequestering carbon dioxide. That's half the equation. Yes. And I think most people don't know that still. And, um, you know, that's why we have these types of public discussions to try to educate. But sometimes, you know, my, my tolerance gets to the point where, you know, I just was reading an article today about we're right at the tipping point of the oceans, that the oceans are right, are so hot right now. We're right at that tipping point that ca caused the mass, the sixth mass extinction of life in our oceans. Yes. And you have a, you have a chain reaction when that happens, when the, the sea life dies out, the plants over bloom and when the plants overbloom, they die off. And when they die off, they pull oxygen out of the water and makes it impossible for a plant or animal life to survive in it. And they become one giant dead zone. 
And then some people say, well, we'll just eat land animals or land plants or whatever. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. 70% of the oxygen is created by phytoplankton in the ocean. That's where that's our life's breath right there in the ocean. We cut that off. We starve off the oxygen for every living creature on this planet. And we're that close to it. I mean, we're talking, we're pumping up against it. It's not a future thing. It's not 20, 30 years. It's here and now. Yes, it is. And we need to end industrial fishing, just like we need to end uh, grazing. You know, the phytoplankton emit a chemical called dimethyl sulfide that rises in the atmosphere, bonds with water droplets, and creates clouds. And the clouds cool the earth. And the, 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 the phytoplankton feed off the waste of whales. Mm. So when humans either intentionally kill whales or when boats mm. bang into whales and kill them, then that's less whale poop in the ocean, that's less phytoplankton, that's less clouds. See, it's a magnificent, complex system of life, and it's just tremendous arrogance on the part of human beings to mess with it. It's what's keeping us alive, that complex system that the first thing we should understand about it is that we'll never understand everything about it. <laughs> and, and so have that respect for the system. And, and the, the, the decent way to express that respect is to leave it alone. Leave the oceans alone. Stop trying to extract all life from the seas. Leave as much of the earth alone as you can. And, you know, if, if everybody would just do one thing, which is to eat the healthiest diet there is, which will increase their lifespan and their well-being. So it's not like asking for a great sacrifice. This will help everybody. So if people would just help themselves by eating a, a whole food, low-fat, plant-based diet, then we could leave 80% of the earth alone. 70% is the oceans, leave it alone. I mean, we could still obviously have our, we have to have some commercial shipping. You know, uh, I'm not saying nobody goes out on the ocean, but end the industrial fishing. And so by ending the industrial fishing, we go a long way to leaving the oceans alone. That's 70% of the earth. If we cut out the grazing and rewilded the grazing land, that's 40% of the non-ice land surface of the earth. That adds up to more than 80% of the earth we can leave alone just by eating human food. It's, and then it's so once simple. left alone, it'll heal. And just like the human being. I mean, it, I, I love this analogy that uh, we are a planet. We are a planet that uh, is a home to 40 trillion plus bio, bio organic creatures, microbes. We call it our microbiome and it lives in and on us. Um, but we, they are dependent on us and we are dependent on them. It's a symbiotic relationship. So we don't have to look very far to understand how important the symbiotic relationship is. We are one. <laughs> we are the planet for those 40 trillion. You know? right. And, they and by the way, on. Jeff, who has the job of counting them? I don't never understood that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, been, that's been going back and forth for a long time. At first, they thought it was over 100 trillion. And now they've narrowed it down to probably 40, 40 to 50 trillion. Um, through different techniques of measuring it. One is, is uh, uh, the, the genetic uh, biome, which is finding all the genetic material of the microbiome, and you can actually capture that since it's hard, much harder to get them alive and figure that out. It's easier to capture all the ones that died and figure out what's there. <laughs> um, but we even have a viome or a virome, which is viruses that uh, live inside our body and live cooperatively. And they actually attack and destroy other pathogenic bacteria and yeasts and molds and other viruses. 
So their viruses or some of the viruses are some of the most best protectors we have inside of our bodies. So, you know, we used to think all bacteria were bad and we started overdosing with antibiotics. And now we know an antibiotic can wipe out our good bacteria as well and really set us back as far as being able to heal and repair, boost our immune system, provide uh, uh, 70 to 80% of our um, tryptophan, uh, which converts to serotonin. Our natural mood elevator happens in our gut. I mean, there's just so many important things that happen in our gut. And I know you touch on this too in the book. Let's get back to the book. I know you've, in this, this being your 12th book, you've done a really nice job at being succinct and covering, you know, uh, meat and masculinity, the microbiome, the environmental impacts, uh, the dietary and nutritional aspects. And then maybe possibly one of the most important things that will really get uh, people to change is here's some kick-ass, you know, uh, foods to eat and how yeah. to make them and make them taste delicious and feel good about what you're eating. So talk about that, because I know a big part of your book, you've worked with Chef AJ and the chef from Forks Over Knives and, and many of these people. It, you know, how do we go about making food really appetizing? I think your, your book does a great job of that. Right. Well, well, in this new book, America Goes Vegan, uh, I work with Tracy Childs, um, who uh, did the recipes. This is the book. And uh, Tracy uh, is a, a, a what's called a food for life chef, certified chef uh, under uh, the Physicians Committee Committee for Responsible Medicine. So she knows how to cook in healthy ways without oil, without sugar, and so all these recipes um, are not only delicious, but they're healthy. And, she, and we focused in this book on comfort foods, on American classic foods, burgers, shakes, fries, mac and cheese, all the foods that Americans think they would have to give up if they went vegan. Well, you don't have to give them up. You just have to eat healthy versions of them. So these are burgers made with grains and mushrooms and potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, all kinds of vegetables. So, um, you know, uh, there's no excuse for, for not eating in a way that's healthy when it's actually more delicious. And, you know, we see this over and over in the scientific literature, um, from polyphenols, which are only in plants, to their effect on the microbiome, which feeds on polyphenols, fiber, uh, oligosaccharides, basically all from plants. And the things that hurt our microbiome are bile-increasing uh, foods, which are foods high in saturated fat, cholesterol, animal proteins. These are the ones that hurt our microbiome. And I'm like, it, from heme iron to the phytic acid bound uh, iron in plants. One causes cancer, the other actually prevents and reverses mm -hmm. cancer. Over and over and over again, we see all these examples that plants are superior to our food, that animal, consuming animal products leads to disease states and consuming plants actually prevents these disease states or even reverses right. them. It's like, how many examples of this do we need before people start really making the connection? I, I'm really not getting it. <laughs> well, Jeff, what you're getting at is there's a pattern. Yes. And that's why within the book, I give the three laws of nutrition, Mercer's three laws of nutrition. And the first one is that the things that are good for you are good for you in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And the second is the things that are bad for you are bad for you in all kinds of ways. Mm. And the third one is when you eat more of the stuff that's good for you, you're going to eat less of the stuff that's bad for you. <laughs> so um, once you see the pattern that when you're eating whole plant foods with plenty of fiber, well, we're only learning more and more now about all the ways the fiber is good for you. We're only learning more and more and more about all the ways the phytochemicals in the food are good for you. It's the pattern is established 
fruits and vegetables are good for you. You know, they do simple experiments where uh, studies where the they find that the people who eat more fruits and vegetables live longer and are healthier. Well, it's not a shocker. <laughs> so, you know, it's just obvious. Nothing could be clearer. It's like two and two and four. Fruits and vegetables are good for you. Meat and dairy are bad for you. And there are so many different ways in which meat and dairy are bad for you that, again, you just have to know that there's a pattern out there. You just have to see the pattern. You don't have to memorize the whole long list of ways in which meat and dairy are bad for you. It, it really is that simple. And, you know, when you look at a human physiology like I have over the years, you see how we're perfectly designed uh, and adapted to a plant-based diet and, uh, in the, and especially in the whole food state. Now, we do have a problem with people eating too much processed foods as well. And that's why, mm -hmm. like yourself, myself, we're very much advocates of a whole food plant-based diet not a vegan junk food diet of pizza right. and Oreo cookies. Uh, yeah, you, that's not that's not a good thing. Um, but obviously there are specific things like uh, cholesterol that are unique to animal products like heme iron uh, that is a known carcinogen that is only found in animal products. It's not found at all in it. So there's some clear differences between negative health impacts and animal products compared to uh, plant products and some clear things on the positive side, like polyphenols and fiber, there's zero in any animal product at all. None. It right. doesn't exist there. So if our body and our microbiome are dependent on this for healthy metabolism, healthy functioning, healthy immune systems, it's really clear which one of these two food groups we should be <laughs> putting in our mouth. Um, but even, even obviously, I'm into the fitness nutrition side of it and seeing at 60 years of age, uh, you know, I just got back to the gym doing 430 pound press downs on uh, for the tricep machine um, that at 60, you know, this is not this is not typical, um, but that my body can recover and heal and repair itself so much better because I'm giving it the proper nutrition. I'm feeding my microbiome what it needs to provide all these amazing metabolites that help the body heal and repair faster. The longevity of it, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And, and, and obviously that's why I do Facebook Lives and why you've written so many books. But mm -hmm. let's go ahead and put up on the screen real quick so that um, people can see. These are the 12 different books, uh, you know, with Howard Lyman, uh, Weight Loss with... Uh, Chef AJ, uh, Food is Climate. I love that title. Um, it really states it as it is. So many different great books, including America Goes Vegan. How would you, how would you summarize your path in all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think my path has been going from being a shy vegan to being a... Um, a vegan who uh, is concerned with spreading the message so that others go vegan. Uh, we, you know, the clock is ticking and we, the only way we save the planet is if we end animal agriculture. There is no, there is no other choice. Um, and what we're up against is culture. People grow up eating the foods they learn to love. They love their parents who serve them those foods. They don't want to believe that their parents were serving them foods that were bad for their health. They don't want to believe that what they're eating is destroying the, the planet and is causing our climate emergency. And so it's, it's hard to get people to see those truths. And of course, your parents served you steak with love, you know, and they thought it was good for you, but it isn't. <laughs> they were wrong. We all make mistakes. You have to say, mom and dad, I forgive you, but what you served me was kind of on the poisonous side. So no more meat. Um, and, uh, you know, my parents served me meat. 
My mother served me liver. She told me that was the healthiest food, liver. Can you imagine that? That's that's where the animal sends its toxins. I mean, why don't you just have, you know, a bowl of toxins for dinner? So, uh, you know, my mother served me terrible things. She, she was well-meaning. She didn't know. So you just have to break that cord and say, uh, you know, this is this is was a mistake. This was wrong. And we we base our cultures around this. So, and of course, in America, we have Thanksgiving with Thanksgiving turkey. Now, Thanksgiving, I, I always thought growing up was just a wonderful holiday, this wonderful holiday that all Americans shared in. It wasn't re related to one religion or another. It's just an, uh, an American holiday to show gratitude, uh, you know, and it's just kind of a fun holiday where people gather. But the turkey, we can do it without the turkey, you know. We can, we can have healthy meals and keep everything else from Thanksgiving. We could even keep the, you know, the cranberry sauce and the mashed potatoes and the sweet potatoes and whatever. Just replace the turkey with something healthy. So it isn't that hard. It doesn't mean we have to lose everything in our culture, but we have to change our cultures a little bit mm -hmm. to accommodate the reality that if we don't, we're going to melt. I, I think uh, scientists like this study uh, just pulled up on the screen um, the meat-related cognitive dissonance. So the psychologists are trying to understand uh, basically this. Researchers have been uh, especially interested in understanding how individuals morally care for animals and wish them no harm, yet simultaneously eat them as food. I mean, this is a complete contradiction, yet the vast majority of the population of the world doesn't even register that. It's, it's not even part of the conversation. <laughs> it, you know, I think it's, it's peculiar, but I guess when people believe that it's healthy and believe that they must eat it for the protein uh, and believe that it's, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, necessary part of life that unfortunately we have to eat animals. Well, no, you don't. And in fact, it's given you heart disease and cancer. Um, and, um, you know, we have a, a government that doesn't, tell us the truth about it. And we have doctors who are not trained in nutrition. So, so many doctors don't tell us the truth about it. And so the only way to learn the truth is by reading books and uh, listening to videos and, and you know, finding it. Um, but the truth is so obvious. <laughs> it's And when I say truth, you know, th there are some things in life where, where it's a gray area, you know, uh, you know, you could think of any number of things where pu in public policy, would it be better or would we be better off, you know, having education run by the state, so the federal government or the localities and issues like that. And it's, there's no truth there. It's just, it's a gray area and you experiment with different systems and you, try to get the one that works the best. But here we're talking truth. I mean, we're talking hard facts. We know with absolute 100% certainty, like we know that hot air rises, we know that meat is bad for the human body. We know that with 100% certainty. Uh, and so we know with 100% certainty that the healthiest diet is a, is a whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet. Dr. Esselstyn did, a stu did two studies in which he reversed heart disease mm -hmm. that took patients with severe heart disease, and he reversed their heart disease using a whole, fat, whole food, low-fat, plant-based diet. Now, nobody has done a study where they've reversed heart disease using sausage, <laughs> you know, there is there is no other point of view on this one. There is no respectable alternative. 
we know the truth with a, with a hundred percent certainty. And when I say that, some people may object. Now, wait a minute. I heard some doctor say something else, or I heard some author say something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're trying to sell books, you know, mm-hmm. or, or maybe they've deluded themselves. I don't know. But they're, it's preposterous. We know, we know the cause of heart disease. We've known it for 100 years, saturated fat and cholesterol. There's no cholesterol in plant foods. And and that's so clear. This um, this study they did a study uh, against the cult of veganism, which the is cult. Our, yes, <laughs> the cult of veganism, unpacking the social psychology and ideology of anti vegans. Um, so they went on uh, Reddit, one of the more popular social media platforms, and uh, they looked at. Uh, 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 almost 4,000 Reddit users and over 45,000 comments back and forth between vegans and anti-vegans uh, and recorded them over a five-year period to kind of distill, okay, what are what are the two sides talking about? <laughs> well, the results from the analysis suggest that um, individual differences that align anti-vegan users with their community include dark entertainment, which is making fun of vegans, like mm, bacon. Uh, So that was one of the most popular. Ex-veganism, oh, I used to be vegan, but fill in the blank, you know, my health got worse, blah, 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 all these negative reasons to try to uh, validate why you should not be vegan. And then, of course, the number three reason that they used by distilling this through a machine learning is taking all the different things the number three most common used defense was science denial. I mean, where do we go from here if if they're not even accepting the legitimate science? Look, I agree there's some some bad science out there, but you can sift through that by using meta-analysis, which is looking at multiple studies so that it's not just cherry-picking a single study. You can look at who the funding is. The funding is usually stated right at the bottom of the studies and most studies. So you can see, is this money coming from the industry or from somebody with a a motive? So you can find these things out by looking at the studies, but there's this just dismissal. Like if somebody says, this does this, here's a study. And it's a huge study on 50,000 people. And, and, you know, they, it was an intervention study, which they actually changed their diet and had a different result. You know, they uh, accounted for the different uh, possible things. All of it can be there and you still get people in complete denial. They just use this dismissal as a tool, like, nope, that's it. I'm not buying any of the science. Just complete. That's the number three most common technique to defend against or deflect, I should say, against a, a vegan's approach to it. So being a science guy, this is this is really frustrating for me because I've waited for 30 years to try to finally get some valid science. And now that we have it, studies actually looking at large populations inclusive of vegans, which we didn't have before. And I'm like, yay, we finally got the studies. We finally got it, including vegans. We finally got definitive research that says, absolutely, this is what's happening. And then you got just complete out and out science denial. And I'm like, where do we go from here? You know, and there are so many other ways too to to prove the truth besides the studies. Just understanding the macronutrients, Mm -hmm. fat, protein, carbohydrate, fiber, and water. Okay, let's start with water. (laughs) A lot of people go through life somewhat dehydrated. Well, where are you going to get more water? From grapes and watermelons and peaches and apples or from steak? You're going to get more water from the fruits. Now, there is some water, they, they use the phrase retained water uh, in the meat. That's because in the slaughterhouse, they, they spray it and you're getting the, the sprayed, filthy, retained slaughterhouse water put in your meat. So there's, 
there's that. But there's more water in plant foods. Now, fiber, again, we learn every day how important fiber is in how many ways. Well, fiber is cellulose, comes from plants. There's no fiber in any animal product, period. So on that one, there's nothing, there's no way you can make the case for, for animal foods. And that is why something like 95% of Americans are fiber deficient. All right. Then there's fat. Well, we've known for at least 70 years that too much fat and saturated fat in the diet leads to heart disease. It also leads to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It also makes you more prone to cancer. So there's there's nothing good about filling your body with an excess of fat. Yes, you need some fats, you need some omega-3 fats, but when Americans are getting sometimes 40, 45, 50% of their calories from fat, that's wildly excessive. And that's because of animal foods and also because of oil. So oil is also another thing to avoid. Um, so in terms of fat, you're much better off with plant foods. And there are some fatty plant foods like avocado or seeds and nuts where those fats are healthier. Um, so for, in terms of fat, you're better off with plant foods. And then there's protein. Well, that used to be the, the ace in the whole argument for the meat side, but T. Colin Campbell has proved that animal protein is carcinogenic. It's also excessive, and the, the body can't store fat. So when you get excess protein, you piss it away, and it leaches calcium from your bones, so it causes osteoporosis. So in terms of protein, plant protein is far superior what does that leave? Carbohydrate. That's what that's the natural fuel for the human body. Uh, you know, apples are going to be 95% carbohydrate. Broccoli will be 80, 85% carbohydrate. Your oatmeal will be 80% carbohydrate. It's the natural human fuel. You don't want to be deficient in the natural human fuel. You don't want to have refined carbohydrates. You don't want to be drinking soda and, uh, and eating sugar, but whole food, complex carbohydrates is the, the stuff of life. So, you know, you wonder, what is it that people demonize carbohydrate? You're talking about carbon, the stuff of life, and water, the stuff of life. <laughs> and, and people seem afraid of that. Carbohydrate. Carbon and water, what are they afraid of? So um, uh, every macronutrient uh, favors plants. And they're, they're all created by plants too. Um, animals don't create the essential amino acids that make up our, our proteins. Uh, they don't create essential fatty acids uh, either as well. Fish don't make omega-3s. They consume omega-3s. So mm -hmm. plants make them. Um, and then uh, we convert them down into longer and longer chain fatty acids. So, you know, vitamins and minerals. Uh, animals by and large don't make vitamins, although some carnivores can make their own vitamin C through endogenous processes. But that's one of the few examples. The rest of it all comes from, and obviously you can get vitamin C made by plants too as well. So there's not a single nutrient that is made exclusively by an animal that human beings require at all. Not one, mm -hmm. not a single one. They're all made by plants. The only two nutrients that we need, uh, three, which are uh, vitamin B12, which is made by bacteria, not animals. Animals don't make B12. Um, vitamin D3, which is made by our own bodies when we get exposed to sunlight, and vitamin K2, which is made by our friendly gut bacteria in a healthy microbiome. So again, it's just sunlight, bacteria, and plants. That is everything nutritionally required for the human being. 
Yeah. Not a single nutrient is exclusively comes from animals as required. None. So why are we taking all of these nutrients from plants, from the sun, from, from bacteria, and then feeding them to an animal just to kill the animal and take its plant nutrients? It just makes no sense on any, any level. It's not economically viable. It's not good on the uh, environment because you're including a whole nother process, a whole nother animal a whole bunch of pollution waste for no reason whatsoever. And you're just taking the nutrients. Not only are you taking the nutrients and just converting them in the animal and eating the plant nutrients, you can actually take like phytate bound plant iron. And when you feed it in an animal, it converts it to heme iron, which is known carcinogen. So you take phytate bound iron, which is a known anti-cancer agent and turned it into a pro-cancer agent by feeding it to an animal. You take uh, beta carotene, which is anti-cancer, and then you feed it to an animal and it turns it into retinol A, which is actually a liver toxic, hepatotoxic to human beings. You make nutrients worse by feeding them to an animal and eating it first. Right. You make them disease causing, from disease preventing to disease causing by feeding them to an animal. So, it, it, on no level does it make sense. It doesn't make sense financially. It doesn't make sense environmentally. It doesn't make sense on a farming level. It doesn't make sense on a compassion level because you're obviously including the death and destruction of the animal. Just, I, I my mind just like is going to go <laughs> sometimes. It's like. It's culture. <laughs> We're up against culture. You know, everybody thinks of culture as a wonderful thing. That's what the whole tourist industry is premised on. You go around the world, experience different cultures. What could be better? And of course, cultures are wonderful, you know. But you can go to Spain and, um, and you know, take in the, the music, the, the flamenco music, mm -hmm. without the bullfighting, you know. Exactly. You can, you can, you know, there are wonderful parts of all kinds of cultures around the world, uh, but we can just stand up to our own cultures and say, yeah, but we got this part wrong. <laughs> we don't have to have cowboys raising cattle and then eating the cattle. Eh, that was a mistake. So, um it's just a question of whether human beings are, are, uh, can stand up to their own cultures and, or, or just be victimized by their own cultures. And because it makes no sense scientifically, it makes no sense in terms of our own survival and our own health to keep doing this. But we're up against people's, uh, people just, uh, being steeped in their culture and being unwilling to change. And that's such a emo powerfully emotional aspect that I think that's the harder part to change. Uh, everything can make common sense to people and still they will follow their emotions. Um, but we have to change the way we feel about certain things. If it's destroying our lives, if it's destroying our planet, and insanely destroying over 80 billion animals and making them suffer for absolutely no reason. It's time we rethink why we feel about the food that we eat. Um, even if there is strong emotional attachments through culture or through religion or through other strongly emotional social aspects, you know, my mom makes the food or I eat with my family and this is what they want to eat. Those are powerfully strong emotions. I, I get that, but it's time we stop uh, because it's it's killing us, it's killing our planet, and it's killing animals and an ungodly um, uh, animal holocaust that's happening right now. It's just insane. It is literally insane. You have to be pathologically insane to believe that this is a good thing to to uh, be participate in the mass slaughter of 80 billion life forms every single year i mean that's that's sadistic and i know people aren't that i know people aren't pathologically insane we've been it's not 
I don't blame the individuals. I blame the culture and I blame the emotions that we get addicted. We get trained this way. We get addicted to these behaviors. We don't want to change because of fears. Fears are very strong compeller for action. And, and that's part of the reason why I do fitness because I want to show people there's no fear of not lose, you know, losing any muscle or strength. Um, here I am at 60, almost four decades of eating nothing but plants. And I'm that, one of the healthiest people I know at my age, um, is, uh, with the exception of those other vegans that I know that are just <laughs> as equally healthy. Yeah. But, you know, uh, my mother, my father, my brothers never made it to 60. And here I am 60, loving life and in and, and perfect health, no medications, no disease states, you know. I would love to have them there. I'm, I know so many people have lost their parents and loved ones, even children at an early age from heart attacks are dying now. That's just, it's sad. And if you really love and you really care about the people who you're around, the people who influence you, well, wouldn't it be better to influence them in a positive direction than to be influenced in a negative direction? I think it's time we shift that and we all have to take on that responsibility to make that choice in ourselves. So I'm really glad that you are writing these amazing books. Let's go ahead and put it up on the screen again because you have done some incredible books that touch on from everything from the Happy Cow Cookbook with my good friend Eric Brent um, to Chef AJ and, and Losing Weight to this book, which is 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 phenomenal for recipes. Um, America goes vegan. Check it out. Grab it on Amazon. Get a copy of this. You're going to be glad you did. It'll give you some great information on the reasons why and even the good recipes that will make you say, what was I afraid of? This is silly. This food tastes awesome. <laughs> you know, I feel better. I can think more clear. I feel happier. I am healthier. What's not to like? When we can do something that we feel really good about, good about having a positive impact on the planet, the animals, and our own health, and then be able to pay that forward, what a gift, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean... You know, I've known people who who thought it would be daunting to go vegan. And really, once you do it, there's nothing daunting about eating human food. You just cook up some vegetables. You add some beans, some lentils. Uh, you know, if you can boil water, you could, you could steam vegetables. You could make pasta. You could make rice. It's not difficult. Uh, and... Um, it's just a matter of being willing to change. Indeed. Well, I looked forward to many more conversations with you, my friend. Uh, uh, how can people get in touch with you and uh, connect well, with you? I have a website, glennmerzer.com. People can contact me there. I put out a newsletter called the Own Your Health Newsletter uh, about once every month or two. Um, and um, and that's where people, oh, and I have a YouTube show now. Um, you can find it just on the Glenn Mercer Show on YouTube, or you can uh, go to the website realmeneatplants.com and find it there. It's also a podcast on all your basic audio podcast platforms. And one of my guests has been Jeff Palmer. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> And I look forward to more chats with you, my friend. Um, yeah, check out Glenn Mercer, the Glenn Mercer Show. You can uh, catch it there. And Real Men Eat Plants, that's for sure. Um, show us your guns. There there it is. Yes. I and just, just this morning, I was bench pressing 600 pounds. How much did you say you did? <laughs> yes. <All right. laughs> now I'm going to be a science denier here. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Um, but yes, stay healthy, my friends. Uh, check out the book. It's an awesome book. Uh, America Goes Vegan. Glenn Mercer, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your wisdom, your humor, uh, which I think is an important part of this movement. 
we got to laugh sometimes. And uh, and uh, all of the amazing books that you've written and contributed, everything you've done, including some more things coming in the future. Tell us about uh, what's coming uh, in the future potentially for you. I've got another book that I hope to put out by the end of the year where I'm just going to make the case plants versus animals as clearly and overwhelmingly as I can in as few pages as I can <laughs> and, um, and without pulling any punches. And I think it's going to be a good one. That's what we need. Cut to the chase. Let's lay it out bare and simple yeah. <laughs> that anybody can get it. And it should be that simple. And I hope it will be um, as we continue to grow. Thank you so much for coming on Clean Machine Live. Thank you again for everything you're doing for this movement. You're, uh, uh, it's so fun and enjoyable to talk to you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.